we are recording this session um, just for future reference. And so um, hopefully if there are folks that are missing the session, we'll load this recorded version up so you can have a reference. Um, and for your reference, we will be holding a couple of these sessions over the course of the next few months, <clears throat> maybe every couple of weeks. So just to get the information out there about the grant and answer any questions uh, for the greater good. Again, my name is Spencer. I am at the Department of Higher Education. I'm the Director of Educational Innovation and I am responsible for the Open Educational Resources Initiative here at the department. Currently have my camera on. I'm going to switch over to having my camera off. You all are welcome to have your cameras on or off as you like. Um, and I will turn my camera back on once the presentation is kind of done and we'll take questions at the end. I do see one little chat popping up here. Yes, Dave, thanks for joining us. All right, <clears throat> so uh, thank you again for, for coming to the information session. Um, in my capacity here at the department, I'm responsible for all things OER, and I have the absolute pleasure of working with an all-star group of colleagues from institutions throughout the state who together comprise the OER Council. Um, and if you all could just put your microphones on mute if you're um, attending and not speaking, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, yes, so I work with the OER Council and we also recently just um, onboarded our student intern. Her name is Lobna and she is a senior at the University of Northern Colorado and she is on the call as well. Thank you, Lobna, so much for joining us. We are delighted to have you. Um, so she'll be joining our team to work on projects as well. So that's kind of our OER team just to give you all a little bit more information. Um, and I think we do have a couple of OER Council members on the call. Um, and if anybody's out there, please feel free to augment anything or support or fill in any gaps that I might miss um, regarding this grant program. <clears throat> Just as a brief overview of the day before we jump into the content and information session, we'll cover some context on how we got, we are, got where we are today, the current work and responsibilities of the council, and more specifically, the grant program that you all, all indicated you're interested in, um, in, in coming to this session. We'll save questions for the end, please, again, as I, as I uh, mentioned before, so please jot down your ideas and thoughts and you can send them through on the champ, chat function or you can um, speak up at a later time. So I have here on our site, if you all are following along with me, on the screen that we're broadcasting, this is our website for all things OER. And so we'll try to keep this page as current as we can to keep you informed of any changes, adjustments, or upcoming opportunities. Um, we do have some things that need to be refreshed on this page, but we are getting it updated. A little bit of background about the Open Educational Resources Initiative here in the state of Colorado. I'm moving forward with the assumption that you all are somewhat familiar with de the definition of open educational resources. Um, and the state does have a formal definition called out by state statute. So if you're interested in what that is, you can find that in House Bill 18-1331, or I can send you the link to that information, or I can define that for you at a later date. But really this work began in 2017 with legislation that gave the Department of Higher Ed a charge to move forward and ask for exploration in this area to determine if it was a good investment of time and resources for the state of Colorado, specifically for higher education. And so in 2017, the department was given a small amount of money to work with an external researcher, uh, convene a group of OER council members, representative of the public institutions of higher education throughout the state, and move forward in, in putting together a report and doing some research and some surveying of the state of Colorado to determine, the, to determine if this was something that the state should look into further. And really the outcomes are outlined in this report that's now on your screen. <clears throat> but what we found was the state had an appetite for this. And when I say the state, I mean all of the stakeholders we engaged with from faculty to staff to students who comprised a majority of our respondents in the survey um, and private citizens and, and, and taxpayers. And so 
um, really everybody was interested in, in saving people money through the exploration of open educational resources. Not to mention some of the other benefits of open educational resources. So uh, we can get into that discussion a little bit later, but that kind of helps you become a little bit more familiar with the origin story of this work at the Colorado Department of Higher Education. So the inaugural council um, took place in 2017 and there was a report and there were recommendations and the recommendations included a few things that were delivered to the joint budget committee and that is the committee from the state legislature who administer the budget of the state. The recommendations were to establish a grant program um, and also to maintain the OER Council as the statewide steering committee. There was also recommendations for the council to explore and advise the department and the commission, and that's the Department of Higher Education's governing board essentially, on policy and reporting around this initiative. There's also a provision in the bill for campus outreach to elevate OER and to help expand the use of open educational resources at our campuses. And we are also charged with, with communication and that in curation of a website with resources. So um, these council members are volunteers and they're very active um, members of our statewide steering committee. They're invaluable to this initiative and they are representative of your institutions. And so if you'd like to know who those folks are, you can simply go to our website and find their name and email, um, or I can let you know who your designated representative might be for your region of the state. Again, back to the legislation. Um, so that recommendation came from the JBC, sorry, to the JBC from the OER Council and the department. And in 2018, legislation was signed um, created this grant program, and in the first year of the grant program, we were awarded uh, just over uh, half a million dollars to grantees throughout the state, distributed to 20 diff 21 different projects in the first year. And so that was last year at this time that we had rolled out the first cycle of three of this grant program. And um, we've, we've been really excited to see the progress of our grantees already. They recently submitted their progress reports, um, a little check-in report that they have for their projects, and it's really exciting to see some of the things that they're reporting back from their campus. A lot of folks have been at this work longer than the state has. Obviously, many of you may be in that category, but we are excited to see what kind of compounded impact, what kind of broadened impact this grant program can help leverage on your campuses. And so, um, it's great to see that through the, the proliferation of this grant program. So in 2019, we again are, are having our grants available to folks um, at public institutions. And we will, I also like to, to mention some of the training opportunities that we have coming up um, for your involvement that are open to public and private institutions. Our open ambassador, open education ambassadors program, which is also open to um, any folks in the state interested in exploring OER and becoming trained on a little bit more familiarity and expertise in the area. So one of our objectives is also to build a community of learning, community of practice around open education as a whole. One way we're doing that is by establishing open education ambassadors throughout the state. So we launched last spring with our first cohort of Open Education Ambassadors. We had over 60 folks come together um, in May of 2019, the day before our statewide OER conference. And in conjunction with the Open Textbook Network, uh, we had a training for our institutions and for those who are attending this Open Education Ambassadors or who, the, who had enrolled in this Open Education Ambassadors program to become more familiar with the practices of, of the Open Textbook Network, the resources provided through the Open Textbook Library, and how we are able to elevate open education as a best practice on our campuses. So that was a training that preceded the Open Education, Colorado Open Education Conference, like I mentioned, on May 31st. And we had over 60 folks, and they were representative of public, private, two-year, four-year, 
community colleges, technical schools, a few K-12 represented, and it was great to see that community start to be built. We are going to have another training and another launch for the Open Education Ambassadors program. That training will be on October 18th, and it will be at Front Range Community College in the, at the Larimer campus in Fort Collins. Registration, it says register here on the presentation, but the registration has not quite yet opened. It will soon. And remember that a majority of this first tr training is going to be a train the trainer session workshop facilitated by the Open Textbook Network. If you're not familiar with the Open Textbook Network, they are an initiative that's been around almost about a decade now, out of the university, started out of the University of Minnesota in their School of Education and Human Development. And they started this initiative pretty organically and have since grown to a massive international organization of which we are consortial members. And being members, the state of Colorado and all of our institutions included in that consortium membership, we are afforded training opportunities, access to certain resources, and then involvement with their greater community of international representatives working on this, working in this open education space. So it's super exciting to be involved with one of the leaders, one of the distinguished leaders in this area. And I think it's a really good opportunity for Colorado to continue to expand um, our expertise and expand our higher education practice um, in, in conjunction with data-driven processes, data-driven practices that the University of Minnesota Open Textbook Network has been um, driving for the last few years. So that's super exciting. So if you're interested in this Open Education Ambassadors program, um, please note on the website is listed um, more information. There is a, an agenda from our spring convening, which I think will be helpful for you all. And it's helpful to build this community so that as you all are obtaining these grants, you have an opportunity to reflect with others um, throughout the state who may or may not also be grantees and also you know, creating opportunities for collaboration is a, again, part of this community building. So I wanted to throw that out. It's something that's a little bit different than last year. Now, as we get a little bit more into the intent of the grant program, um, these are some of the metric, or these are some of, I shouldn't say metrics, these are some of the goals set forth by the statute, House Bill 1331 that I mentioned earlier. So one thing that the governor would like to do, and one thing that the Colorado Department of Higher Education is also focusing on is cost containment in higher education specifically. How can we save students money um, as, as we know that student loan debt exceeds $1.2 trillion in the United States. And we know that appropriations for post-secondary education in Colorado are some of the lowest in the country. So what can we do with, with what we're given through this initiative? Obviously we have um, larger issues to discuss, but through this initiative, how can we start to make an impact? What are the things that we can adjust? The textbook costs and the costs of course materials are something that are well within our grasp as both educators and instructors. And so it's really exciting to see the meaningful impact that we can have for students and, and for the lives of our students while maintaining a high expectation and a high caliber, high quality material in our classes. So this is one thing that we see open education doing throughout the nation and throughout the world. And we'd like to do that more here in Colorado. So this grant opportunity is an, is an opportunity for our educators, for you all, to pursue this work. Um, also, the grant program is meant to elevate open educational resources in Colorado as a best practice. We've seen a lot of information that suggests and data and, and, and reports and studies that suggest that OER has no impact to student learning. And in many instances, it has a positive impact to student learning or student success. And so if we know that student success is not being compromised and yet we can save students money and we can customize the learning experience to our learning outcomes, to our course objectives, to our program objectives, this seems to be a good thing for education. This seems to be an opportunity for us to make a difference in students' lives. Um, another point is to encourage innovation and collaboration. I think one thing that many of you have probably noticed, for those of you familiar with the open education community, it's very collaborative in nature, very community-centered. 
And I think this is really special uh, because in higher education, we're very competitive. But at the same time, how can we leverage the amazing expertise of our colleagues? There are so many experts in many different fields. And if we're, we're sharing that information and we're pursuing a common goal as educators, we can really be a lot more innovative by building off of what has been shared with others. So that's another point that I'd like to highlight. And finally, um, this is really in alignment with the Colorado Department of Higher Education Master Plan, which many of you may or may not be familiar with. And so I'll just highlight some of the goals from the CDHE Master Plan here. Of course, our overarching goal is to increase attainment to 66% by the year 2025, which is rapidly approaching, as many of you would agree. And underneath that goal, we have some strategic goals that are aimed to help us get to that overall 66%. Um, you see them here. I won't detail each and every one of them. And some folks may argue that OER could help um, support any one of these strategic initiatives. And I know for a fact that many of your institutions also find these strategic initiatives um, somewhere embedded in their mission, pol mission or policy. That's not by accident, right? The state is working very closely with your institutions to make sure we're all moving in the same direction. So what's neat about this grant program is that we can map the outcomes from your grant program to these strategic goals at the CDHE and funnel them through, of course, the missions in your departments, your faculties, and at your institutions. So it's super exciting to see things moving forward to actually move toward these goals that we've identified because we know in higher ed with the iterations of goals and strategic plans, we often get exhausted, but this is a really meaningful way to contribute to those goals. I think most probably blatantly, the strategic goal number four is really in alignment with the OER grant program. We're investing in affordability for students um, and innovation for faculty, innovation in education. So this is super exciting and also in alignment with the state's goals. <clears throat> now a little bit more about the grant program. Um, there are two tiers, two levels of grant funding. And those are the institutional grants, which will range anywhere from $10,000 to $100,000 this year. And faculty and or small group grants at the institutions, which could range from $250 to just under $10,000. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about those and what they might look like. They're detailed a little bit more in the RFP, but for your information, the institutional level grants are usually an institutional um, initiative that's housed, it could be housed anywhere on campus, but a collaborative effort that's trying to involve a number of stakeholders, a number of faculty, staff, and students in a comprehensive program. This is really exciting. We've seen this in the first year. Um, quite a few colleges and universities were awarded institutional grants, 15 to be exact. And it's really exciting to see the comprehensive approach that they've had to this initiative. They're running things from, you know, pro professional development opportunities for their faculty and staff to involvement opportunities for their students. They're gathering people for learning communities. They're offering stipends to faculty. They're um, using funds to support graduate research assistance to help with the development of open education projects and products. Um, they're doing all kinds of neat and fascinating things and we just gathered information from our grantees and we'll re be reporting that back out to help folks learn a little bit more about what this looks like on some of our campuses um, and that report will be coming in October. So these are more of the comprehensive grants and like I said the range is anywhere from $10,000 to $100,000 for about a year and a half worth of support. The faculty and small staff, small group or staff um, level grants, which are a little bit smaller in the sum of money, can still be just as meaningful. And we've seen some really neat projects specific to um, particular courses, for example. One group had said, hey, we weren't finding any OER materials for our subject matter, um, and we're subject matter experts, so we're gonna set forth and use these funds to create our own open text. 
And so that's very exciting. Um, we've seen other people putting together resources for specific disciplines or specific programs at their campus, writing programs. There's one in um, an engineering program, for example. So diverse and representative of different disciplines and a little bit more specific and tailored to specific courses um, in comparison to the institutional level grants. I will also say those who have received grants in year one that we are carving out a portion of funds up to about half of the available funds and the available funds are total $1 million this year uh, for continuation of projects for current grantees. So that's detailed in the RFP as well. And if you think that you have a good program going and you want to continue the work and you want to map that out for the department, um, you can resubmit a proposal that will help us to reassess where you're at and see what type of funding you might need for continuing your program for another year and a half. Two points that I wanted to mention specifically about the grant and some of your um, administration of the budget. This year we have a written policy that says indirect costs are allowable up to 5%. So last year we asked folks to minimize indirect costs, but we understand that many institutions um, and many grant offices must have a written policy around this. So our written policy is up to 5% of what your total um, budget ask is can be for indirect costs. So keep that in mind as you're, as you're writing because um, if you're working with your grants office, it may look different for other competitive grants that they're applying to. One other thing to keep in mind, partial funding of RFP of proposals and revisions to the scope of work are allowable. So after review, and this happened last year, we could come back, the department could come back to the um, proposer and say, hey, we really like what you've done with A and B, but we're gonna ask you to revise C or we see that you've asked for X amount of money, we are able to provide you with Y amount of money, please move forward with amendments to meet this demand. Um, and so essentially what we're trying to say is that we're, we want to be able to review the proposals um, in detail and provide the feedback from the expertise um, and expert opinion of our reviewers to say how do we think we can move forward as a state, as a collective, to have the most meaningful impact. So remember, um, if you do get feedback from your proposal, um, that is not irregular. This happened last year to many of the proposals from last year. I know questions are probably starting to boil up at this point, so just jot those down, and we're getting close to the end. Sections of the RFP are detailed. They're, they, they vary slightly from the institutional level grant to the small group or individual level grant. So please keep that in mind. If you're writing to the criteria of one or the other, I would recommend just detailing, uh, being detailed about what the required sections are. So please refer to the RFP in this instance. The rubric for evaluating the proposals directly reflects the selection criteria and the sections of the proposal that we've um, laid out in the RFP. And I think it's quite clear we've had, so we had some feedback provided to us from the first year of grantees. And so we've kind of clarified a few things and hopefully made it a little bit user, a little bit more user friendly for this next year. Um, so you should be able to look at the RFP and, and understand a little bit more clearly than last year. Um, and if not, I'm more than happy to take questions at any time about the RFP. Additionally, we did provide a budget template. Now this is an optional template that folks can use. Um, I think last year there were a number of different versions of budgets and we're okay with however you might want to convey that information, but we've given you a template that might be helpful in just getting things started. Two points of emphasis that I'd like to remind folks about um, from the RFP that were created last year and still exist this year. There's an emphasis on accessibility. There's a growing conversation, and this actually um, partially has something to do with OER and partially not, is what I'm learning. Because of the movement from your traditional textbook 
to more of digitally offered resources, um, accessibility has become more and more of an issue or topic of discussion, and, and rightfully so, that people should be paying attention to if they're establishing new course materials. So OER, a lot of the time, are accessible, but if you're establishing new OER or putting implementing them into your courses, part of this grant program, you're using the grant funds to do that, we would remind you that allocating funds from your grant to ensure accessibility is perfectly allowable and encouraged. So keep in, keep in mind. Another point is the licensing of any of the materials established. If you're going forth and creating original materials or adapting other materials to meet the needs of your course, part of the requirement of this grant is to make them accessible to others in the state and beyond. So we have a provision that says you should select a create an appropriate Creative Commons license. If you don't know what a Creative Commons license is, this is the thing that really enables OER. Um, and, and this particular movement of Creative Commons license is, is really important to the world of OER and open education as a whole. And we will be holding a workshop on Creative Commons licensing this fall. So if you'd like to learn more, that is one of the professional opportunities, professional development opportunities offered through the Open Education Ambassadors Program. I would encourage you all to see the final page of the agreement, which details both points of emphasis and also lets you know what you're committing to as one of our grantees. That includes reporting, that includes attending statewide activities, that includes sending folks to some of these trainings, and you can build that into your budget as well. So please keep that in mind that part of your grant funds can be used to support your open education ambassadors to travel to these grant, uh, grant funded activities or these state funded activities rather. Finally, I'd just like to talk, talk a little bit about the timeline. The RFP opened last week at the Colt Conference at CU Boulder, which was a fantastic conference by the way. If you didn't get a chance to attend, there was an OER track, which was super exciting. Um, and for the next couple of months, as I mentioned, we will have ongoing information sessions and council meetings to answer any questions that folks might have. We also have a training on October 18th that I mentioned, and we'll have some remotely available trainings, which will be posted to the Open Education Ambassadors site. Um, so lots of touch points, lots of opportunities to connect, and we're excited to connect with you all. November 1st is when the RFP closes. So keep that in mind, November and December will be the review period. It's really mostly the entirety of November, about a month for the reviewers to review. And then in December, we're taking these um, proposals as a discussion item to our governing board, the Colorado Commission on Higher Education, the CCHE. The CCHE does not have a January meeting, so um, kind of a, in a strange schedule at that time but we will visit them at their very at the, the following meeting, their very next meeting, and that should be February of 2020. Apologize for the, um, for the misprint there. So in February of 2020, we will be taking it as a consent item and it will be approved by the commission. Uh, we'll answer any questions that they might have as well. And then in March of 2020, the first payment will be shared with the institution. So you will know about your, um, our intent to fund your project in early 2020, most likely January of 2020, and you will receive funds after the February meeting, no later than March of 2020. And that will, what's different this year than from last year is we will be having three installments of the payment. So that will be the first installment of the um, three, three even installments of the payment. And that'll be the first payment. And in July of 2020, progress reports will be due um, and the next payment will be made. So once we receive your report, um, we will give you the next payment and that will probably be July to August of 2020, right before the school year starts. And then the final payments will come in March of 2021, seeing as folks will be making progress um, towards their goals outlined in their proposal. And then in July of 2021, we will be asking for a final reporting and the return of unused funds. Unfortunately, uh, we are required, the department does not get to keep these funds, and we are required to return these funds to the state general budget, general fund budget. And so 
I, what I would rather see is the budget amendments throughout the course, which are allowable with our grantees by request. If you're thinking you're not going to meet your targets and there's a way to allocate your funds to still um, meet your goals or to exceed your goals, I would recommend those amendments take place so that we're not giving money back to the state general fund. That's kind of a, a last resort on our end. So this is roughly the timeline that we're working with other than this misprint here in February of 2020. Um, and hopefully it gives you a better idea of how to frame your work and maybe set up some of the budgets and some of the projects that you all might be moving forward with. We're just at about half an hour, um, which I wanted to keep this presentation to about half an hour, but I'm happy to take questions that are for kind of the greater good of the audience. If they're more specific to your campus or your initiative, or you have something very specific to your individual um, thought process, I would request that you take those offline and shoot me an email or give me a phone call and Lobna and I will be happy to answer your questions at that point. So any questions from folks? Feel free to speak up or send something through the chat. Not seeing anything coming through. Um, I am happy to hang out for a little while and see if anybody has anything to offer. Um, again, we're really looking forward to receiving grants. I think for me, it's super exciting because you all drive the work behind all these ideas that we're coming up with. But this is a really meaningful way to make an impact in, in people's lives, in our students' lives. So um, I am very encouraged by this initiative. The governor is a great champion of this initiative. If you've ever wanted to do something that really aligns with the vision of state leadership policymakers, um, or if you don't care about that type of thing and you just want to do a really cool project on your campus, there's an opportunity to do both of those. I did see one chat question come through. Um, no questions. Thanks. Okay, great. So I will stick around, but thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day.